Welcome to Made in Science, the official podcast of the University of Stuttgart. Today we are meeting Professor Katharina Hölzle, who has been head of the Institute of Human Factors and Technology Management at the University of Stuttgart and the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, IAO, since April 2022. Her research includes disruptive technologies and innovation, digital transformation of the organization, human factors, and entrepreneurship. Professor Hölzle holds her diploma degree in industrial engineering from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in 1998 and her Master of Business Administration from the University of Georgia at Athens in 1997. She earned her PhD in 2008 at the Technical University Berlin, where she also uh, habilitated in 2011 in the area of management. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. At the University of Stuttgart, your focus is on the topic of working environments of the future, especially in the context of product development. For this, a new lab on hybrid working and product development is going to be set up at the Institute of Human Factors and Technology Management. May I ask what this lab will look like? Yes, of course. So we have already been building and working in a so-called future work lab that builds on our research and also the projects we are having with the companies, how the future of the production floor will look like. So in this big hall, we have robots, but we also have working stations where uh, you're Uh, helped by virtual reality glasses and so on. And what we're now doing is we're actually building up on these experiences and extending the work environment through extended um, reality technologies, so-called XR technologies. And this is what we Well, we still call it the metaverse, although we're not really happy with the, the with that name. I mean, we're building on Neil Stevenson here, not on Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but what we're trying to, uh, or what we want to research is how will we work in the future in the context of engineering, in product development, but also on the production floor, if we are using virtual realities and virtual technologies, but also still work together in a physical setting. So this is what we mean by hybrid environments. And for us, the metaverse is a hybrid environment. And for this, you will also need very interdisciplinary approach, uh, from my understanding. Various disciplines will be involved and presented uh, in that particular lab. Yes, that is true. And this is what we have been doing also over the last year. So we strongly rely obviously on engineering. Um, so we have mechanical engineers and electric engineers, but we also have computer scientists involved. Actually, this field has been growing um, using digital technologies, but now also artificial intelligence. We have neuro um, scientists because it ha also has a lot to do with our mind and brain. And then obviously we have social sciences and humanities involved. One focus will also be on people and their role in product development. Um, I'm really curious uh, to find out uh, what, how do you define, how do you see, in which dimension you understand uh, the role of people in product development. So the role of people is actually the heart and soul of our research because without a human, It's hard to imagine how creativity and inspiration and, and new things actually um, develop. Although we are currently seeing that this belief that the human is at the core of creativity and creating something new is actually shattered because the artificial intelligence somehow creates new things where we have believed in the past that this is something very deeply rooted in the human. So the human for us is still the focal point and it's the center of brevity, if you want, for 
creating new things, for working together interdisciplinary, as you just pointed out, uh, and also with respect to making sense out of technologies. But as you and as our listeners might imagine, this role and, and, and this focal point has um, experienced quite some changes over the last month by uh, the upcoming of ChatGPT, by the upcoming of the extended reality technology. So I think understanding the role of the human is more important than ever. And that role is shifting. It is not phasing out, uh, I guess. Well, hopefully hope. not. I mean, you know, that I guess is is um, uh, is the hope of all of us. Uh, and, and, and we do know uh, the scientists and researchers claiming singularity and uh, the uh, advent of uh, an, a true artificial intelligence. But uh, as far as I'm concerned... Uh, I still believe that our future will be human-driven, hopefully, oh. at least to some parts. <laughs> that, is, that should be very good news for the bachelor students, the master students, uh, and everybody on the executive level, uh, both at national and international universities, whom you also teach. Right. Uh, and uh, you teach technology, innovation management, entrepreneurship, human factors. Uh, in, uh, to these various groups. I wonder, how do these groups actually take up the suggestions um, that you teach, um, the scenarios uh, that you uh, develop? Uh, are they all reacting in the same fashion, um, given their various backgrounds? Or are there significant differences in, uh, in these? And if so, how does that look like for you in the classroom? There are actually significant differences. So uh, if I separate those three groups, as you did, I would say that the bachelors, for them, the overall notion of learning concepts, learning this new world of technologies, engineering, product development, management, is something they haven't experienced before at school. And it's also, I usually come a little later in their bachelor studies, so I usually do not teach in the first or second semester because if we look at um, technology management or mechanical engineering here at the University of Stuttgart, we use the first four semesters to really lay the basis. So they are learning mathematics, technical mechanics, thermodynamics, you name it. And, and then after they have grabbed the um, scientific concepts, I come in and explain them why it's so important to, knew, to, to know these concepts and how these can actually be applied in reality. So the fundamentals of product development. What is it? What is product development, by the way? How has it changed over the years? So I'm trying to bring the real-life applications to them. And, and I see how they struggle because they are not familiar with the surroundings of companies, for example, or research institutions that actually develop products and, 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 and materials and uh, uh, services. So for them, it's, it's a whole new world. And it's also a shift in learning the fundamentals of mechanics or mathematics to product development, for example, or human factors. Now, the master students usually have, have laid this basement and they have worked in companies they have they have done their internships so they have at least experienced this industrial setting and for them it's I always start with a little repetition and I'm sometimes surprised of uh, how le how how few they remember of the concepts from bachelor but I guess that's normal and and then we're really getting into more depth uh, of these concepts. So building on 
what, how does the product development process look like? What are instruments to, for example, support the quality? How can we now move that to the virtual world? Within human factors engineering, building on the concepts of what are psychological and physical um, requirements and abilities of a workplace, now how are different concepts like new work, for example, shaping these uh, requirements? How does stress uh, relate to work performance? How can we increase work performance? So it's really kind of building up on these concepts, extending their horizon. Now for executives masters, the, the classroom is also from, from the spirit a lot different because they discuss, they ask, they critically reflect on these concepts because they say, all right, you know what? I mean, this is purely theory. This doesn't apply to practice. So it's really interesting to involve and get engaged into this discussion and learning also from them what works and what doesn't work. And you see, and that's my goal, in the end or maybe in between the spark in their eyes when they realize, oh, this is interesting and I wonder how I can apply that into my daily work. When you talk about the daily work, um, that may also be of interest to the Baden-Württemberg Ministry of Economic Affairs, whom uh, you are a technology counselor for. So you were appointed uh, earlier uh, this year in April 2023 uh, in that particular position. What does this position entail and, and how did it come about? Okay, let's, let's start with the beginning. So... Um, I used to uh, be an advisor to the federal government of Germany. I was part of the expert commission for research and innovation for four years. And I was also part of the high-tech forum, which consulted the German government um, in the area of their high-tech strategy. So I have gained some experiences uh, in the notion of how to translate science and scientific findings into practical policy recommendations. Recommendations. Um, so that was a little bit of my background when I uh, came to Baden-Württemberg. And then there were a couple of discussions where I was involved at the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And uh, at some point of time, the minister invited me to have lunch with her. And we had a very um, lo lively discussion around different topics. And um, a couple of weeks later, she called me and she offered me the job as technology advisor or counselor. So being an informal advisor to the ministry. And if a minister calls you and asks you to become that, you don't decline. You're, you, you are flattered. You, and that I remember at that point in time, I was a little overwhelmed because I thought, well, it's just, you know, it's less than a year that I'm here in those two new positions. And uh, but uh, yes, obviously, I, I felt um, I felt the call of duty. I would say, and and I and I mean it by 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 saying that. So I think that we as researchers, as professor, we have that duty to translate our research, our knowledge into the broader world, to society, and 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 to policy. So second part of your question: What does it entail? Um, it is translating latest findings of our research but obviously you know we, we started with the virtual engineering and so on that is a little bit of interest to the ministry but obviously there are a lot more things so right now i'm drafting the innovation strategy for the state of baden württemberg and what i'm trying to do there is i develop scenarios where the economy could be in 10 years from now. So will we be deindustrialized? Will we, will we be a pure service-oriented economy? Will we be still an industrial power horse, but probably a lot more in the hybrid space, you know, relating back to the metaverse? Or will we be an economy that is purely focusing on, for example, medical applications in combination with artificial intelligence and quantum computing. So a scenario 
based approach to an innovation strategy, making recommendations of which technology fields to focus on, how to build innovation ecosystems, how to extend current innovation ecosystems. So um, that is um, a focus of my work right now. And then obviously you have several other obligations like flying to Canada with a minister and making connections with universities and companies over there. Uh, yesterday we had the award, the Innovation Award of Baden Württemberg. So, you know, selecting companies, startups who who are eligible for this, um, trying to discover weak signals, raising them to the ministry, saying, I think you should be looking into this. So it's um, it's manifold, I would say. It is that. It's very complex. And I think it's also perhaps for sure necessary to have a view at the broad international developments um, in this context uh, as well. What happens where? Uh, what are the driving uh, forces and also areas uh, in particular regions uh, of the world? How, how do you keep track of that? It is really important because we are a strong innovation powerhouse, but we are... Obviously, we are just a state, and we are a state in a small country of Germany. We're part of a small region of Europe. So if we think about the future of economy, there are so many things we do not have. We do not have hydrogen. Well, I mean, we, we, we can produce it, but it's really expensive. We do not have all materials available in Baden Württemberg or, or Germany. So we are we need these international corporations. So Full stop. Now, how do we, how do I keep track? Well, obviously, I always feel that it would be great to have 48 hours per day. Uh, I do not. Uh, so I have a great team around me. I have a, a team of researchers, um, of scientists within my two institutes who provide me with insights, who uh, give me a warning, who I'm in constant exchange uh, to learn from them and then also have a little bit of outposts in, you know, I just mentioned Canada and then and I met the chief innovation officer of Quebec and, it, you know, he's kind of now one of my um, um, exchange partners to bounce back ideas. I, I was in Australia a couple of weeks ago. And so it's you build your network, you're, and it's a give and take, right? I, I do the same thing for them. You know, if, if there is like, for example, I, I was at Quantum Gardens on Monday. I met with the IBM people there. We are building this quantum computing uh, cluster here and for Europe. So it's also my duty to, you know, it's, it, it's a give and Give, give and take, I, I would say. You also told about uh, some aspects from uh, former positions and also uh, in advisory functions already. Now, from 2019 to 2022, you were head of the IT entrepreneurship department at the Hasso Plattner Institute at the University of Potsdam and also spokesperson of the Potsdam Graduate School. And from 2011 to 2019, you were professor of innovation management and entrepreneurship at the University of Potsdam. Which aspects from that particular decade, I'm tempted to say, uh, are especially relevant for your current work? What have you taken or what do you still take from that experience at the uh, Hasso Plattner Institute and also being the chair? Uh, um, being the professor of innovation management and entrepreneurship um, in a different region, uh, at a different university. Um, how do we benefit? I would say um, if I have to drill it down, um, there are five things. So first of all, starting at the University of Potsdam, I had the privilege and the obligation to teach business administration students. Um, that is a different kind compared to engineering students. And it was okay, I would say. Um, it didn't necessarily make me too happy. Why not? Because for me, innovation happens where engineering meets application. 
And if you teach business administration, you have a lot of, you know, different things. And you need business administration, you need management, don't get me wrong. But for my particular fields, it's not the best grounding. Um, yeah, not, not the best grounding, I would say. So uh, I always try to, you know, I had a cooperation with the Technical University of Berlin, uh, co-teaching a class of technology management with a, a colleague there. I also taught in the science faculty. So I always try to keep these relations. And this leads me to my second um, learning I take with me. I uh, early on engaged in the Hasso Plattner School of Design Thinking because design thinking is that language, that process that helps you to cross those disciplines. And uh, as I strongly believe in the interdisciplinary power, design thinking provided me with a framework, with a process, with a mindset to cross those boundaries. And this is something that is very deeply rooted in my teaching, but also actually in my research using the principles of design thinking thinking. So second. Now third, becoming a professor of innovation management and entrepreneurship at the University of Potsdam, entrepreneurship was completely new to me. I had no experiences in entrepreneurship before. So I discovered a new field for me. I built up the uh, Potsdam Entrepreneurship Edu uh, Experience Lab. So really trying to get the entrepreneurship mindset in all disciplines, all facul faculties of the university. University of Potsdam. So I'm taking a strong route from what is entrepreneurship? Why is it so important? How can we foster entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurial mindset? And for me, this is not only funding your own company or your own business. It's a lot more. Entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mindset for me is looking across, seeing opportunities, recognizing problems and finding solutions. So third part. Now, fourth part, being the head of um, the graduate school made me, and I was that before, but it really kind of put it to a different level, is the importance of supporting PhD students, of providing a framework, of providing support, of being there for them, of making sure that they are our future and they need people who are there for them. And we're still not there yet at many, many universities. So PhD students are often in a role where they feel they're neglected, nobody's interested in their research, they can't pursue their PhD uh, endeavors, they are paid not adequately. So, you know, being, and I guess that's kind of now being uh, a very strong proponent of PhD students and giving them visibility and giving them support. Fifth and last learning, and this comes from the Hasso Plattner Institute, Teaching computer science, looking at computer science students, realizing that we had a female percentage of 12% made me very angry. And I came to realize that there are structural pro problems, that there are organizational problems, and there are mindset problems which prohibit girls from entering computer science, but also the overall STEM discipline. And that, for example, led me to be one of the founders of the She Transforms IT initiatives that led uh, initiative that led me to having the first women in tech conference at the Hasso Plattner Institute that led me to be the um, spokesperson of the female students and PhDs and, and, you know, many, many other initiatives. And, and I think, you know, in a nutshell, I'm taking all of these five fields and probably there's a lot more, which is inherent uh, knowledge, but, but this is what I, what I bring to the University of Stuttgart. And I see that in all of these five fields, we still have room for improvement. And to use this room for improvement, you are convinced that we can only overcome the challenges of today and tomorrow with various expertise, ex various experiences and various backgrounds. This requires, as you say, a common language, 
also interdisciplinarity, and heterogeneous teams and organizations willing to take risks and move forward courageously. Now, let me ask you, what was the biggest, let's say professional, risk that you have taken in your life so far? That is a good question. So, taking a risk. Um, I would answer twofold. First one was jumping from a full professorship, full tenured, being a, a public agent at the University of Potsdam to the Hustle Plattner Institute because I left my public contract. The Hustle Plattner Institute is a privately owned uh, organization. And uh, I was then just a regular employee there. So, uh, you know, there were many people saying, are you completely crazy? You are a full tenured professor and you give it up? And I said, well, yes, this is entrepreneurial, right? This is, this is the entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I have come to realize that um, that organization, as I said, had many shortcomings. Um, and when the opportunity uh, manifested with the University of Stuttgart, um, that was another risk because I have three children. They are grown up by now. I mean, not completely left the house at that point in time. So they, all three of them were still at home, but uh, being teens. Um, and accepting the position in a faraway country, if you will, if you come from Potsdam. Um, and also moving to an engineering faculty while being an industrial engineer. Um, but, you know, my, my former professorship, as you correctly pointed out, was innovation management and entrepreneurship. So, you know, it was uh, a new field. It was a completely new surrounding um, and also taking over um, the double head position of University Institute and Fraunhofer Institute, uh, I guess you could say that was a risk. And a second smaller one was uh, moving the whole family to Sydney just for one semester uh, because I had a research sabbatical and I figured this is a chance, which is a wonder wonderful chance you are given as a professor to be able to take research sabbaticals for a semester. And I decided we will all go. Uh, with all the consequences of my husband leaving, uh, quitting his job to be able to join us, uh, moving three kids at that point in time, 10, 12, and 14, finding, you know, everything just new. And we did that on a very short, actually, uh, period of time. So uh, probably it wasn't too much of a professional risk because I was still in that safe framework. But it was a personal risk, uh, and um, at you know there were several in instances where I felt, am I doing the right thing? You know, doing this, pursuing this very own and and and, and personal dream, and and you know taking the whole whole family. Definitely, we send at this moment our regards to Potsdam and to Sydney. Uh, so uh, we hope uh, that whoever will listen to us there uh, can also learn from the experiences uh, that we just heard. We have already said that your research areas are disruptive technologies and innovation, digital transformation of the organization, human forces, and sorry, it's human factors and entrepreneurship. In which of these fields or areas do you see the biggest potential for the future and in which the biggest challenge here in Germany? So the biggest challenge, let me start with that one, uh, because then my, my hopes also uh, arise from there. So the biggest challenges are that... We have lost our entrepreneurial spirit. We have lost our curiosity and our willingness to just do things and be very vocal about it. What I see if I talk to my students, if I talk to the companies, is a lot of fear, is a lot of uncertainty, is a lot of 
well, I actually would like nothing to change. And at the same time, realizing this is not going to happen. And we have neglected over the last 16 years of providing our society with the tools and instruments and the mindset to conquer these challenges, to be happy about accepting challenges and moving forward. And this is this is a part of the educational system. This is part of an overall political system of our society. So the challenge is to be a curious scout explorer of the future, of going over barriers, and we have built many barriers to innovation. We have, you know, and, and I guess we could talk hours about that, about all the administrative barriers and so on and so on. But having that entrepreneurial mindset and saying, well, you know, this is not a good situation, this is a crisis, but we will jointly, all of us, actually manage and, 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 and uh, master this challenge. So these are the challenges. And, and then, obviously, I, I could go on, right? It's like we have neglected infrastructure. We have neglected digitalization. We have neglected digital technologies uh, overall, and, and you name it. But, but I think it all starts with this mindset. So what makes me optimistic? Now, today was um, the uh, information day for... Uh, pupils coming from schools all over the state of Baden-Württemberg. And I had, I would say, about 700 students in the lecture hall. And I told them, these are the challenges. And if you study engineering, if you come to the University of Stuttgart, you will find solutions to these challenges. So I am a strong believer in our young generation, but also in our old generation. I think that we have the means to conquer those challenges. I think we can overcome these barriers. There's a lot we need to change. And yeah, well, I, you know, it's like, and, and, and I think actually right now, because we have this multiple crises, right? It's like, everything. It's deglobalization. It's the demographic challenge. It's the digitalization challenge. Um, it's, I forgot one D, demographic, deglobalization, digitalization. Um, there's a fourth one. Well, it, it'll come to me. Right now we have the, um, the challenge of uh, saving 100 billion euros, which we have already assigned to different projects. So this is the time when innovation happens. Because if nothing works anymore, we need innovation. So that gives me hope. You said you were deputy chair of the Expert Commission for Research and Innovation, advising the German government on research and innovation policy questions. So in a way, you were already part of that process. Uh, I'm sure, getting to know you here, that your drive for uh, and call for uh, more courage uh, in innovation and necessity also in innovation uh, was heard and, uh, and that you uttered that one. When we look at research and development, let's just take R&D, uh, research and development in Germany. Um, from your perspective, what needs to be changed mostly? Or is it? Is this an area that already has very well working inherent processes by definition uh, so that uh, this goes kind of um, separately, perhaps? No, I, I don't think it goes separately. So um, Germany... A state of Baden-Württemberg especially is an innovation power horse. It still is. If you look at the numbers, uh, we are spending overall 3.2% of our overall, um, overall spending. That's not a bad number. And as expert commission for research and innovation, we were always aiming for 3.5%. And we have been on a good trajectory. So the overall expenses for research and development in Germany is high. We have many um, companies that invest heavily in research and development. So that is 
the good news. Now, what we are seeing over the last years, and this is not only due to corona, that especially small and medium um, sized enterprises have lowered their research and uh, their expenses for research and development. And this is due to the fact that they feel that they don't get enough out of the research and development process. And that is concerning. So the question we need to ask is, why do they believe it? And if you talk to them, they say, it is so bureaucratic. It has so high administrative barriers. So they are just thriving on the current business models. So looking at the total of companies, what we have seen, because business and the economy was thriving, that they neglected the expenses for research and development because, you know, they couldn't sharpen the saw because they were busy cutting trees. So this now has to change and they have to realize that the future needs R&D investment. Now, this is now, and this would be a recommendation, it has been a recommendation of the expert commission, is the state the federal government needs to support spending for R&D. So we need tax cuts, we need uh, tax redemptions for these R&D expenses. There has been some right movements, but it's not enough. So first recommendation. Second recommendation I also mentioned, uh, it's cutting down on administrative barriers. It must be a lot easier to just, you know, have that innovative experiment and just try out artificial intelligence within uh, certain regulations. So calling for um, experimental sandboxes, just try things out, Be get rid of bureaucracy. So this is something we also need to focus on. And then third, and that's mo probably the most important one, we need a better education system. When we look at our schools, that we look at our universities, I mean, I mentioned that to these young people today. There were 700 people sitting in a huge lecture hall where you have diagonal tables where there's no room for a laptop or a tablet. There are no power outlets. I mean, this is ridiculous. Ridiculously, right? It's we're try, we're claiming to be a high tech country, but the way we are teaching in our schools and our universities, it's the same thing as thirty or forty years ago. So if my grandmother comes to life and she goes into a classroom, she would say, "Oh, this is so interesting. I know this." So this needs to change. So it's education, it's bureaucracy and administration, and it's uh, an overall tax system or an overall system where we give power to the companies. And no, I disagree with, for example, my colleague Maria, Mariana Matsukato here, the state is not the best innovator. The state has to provide freedom for innovation and our researchers, our scientists, our universities, our companies, they will do the innovation. The final part of this very engaging, passionate uh, argumentation and conversation uh, is what we call moment seven. So we have collected seven questions that we would like to ask you. Please answer them short, as short as possible. Moment one, Spätzle or Maultaschen? <laughs> both? No, um, if, if it can't be both, uh, Spätzle. Moment two, one thing that you could change about the world would be Optimism. Moment three. Do you have a media recommendation for us? A book, uh, some, I don't know, uh, streaming, uh, whatever comes to your mind. Radio program. Can I have more than one or just one? Do I need to drill it down? If you have different ones for different genres, uh, fine. 
Okay, so I go with Alles Gesagt from Zeit, which broadens my horizon. I go with a Handelsblatt disruptive podcast for innovation. And I go with everything Adam Grant is writing on disruption. Moment four. The best advice that you have ever received was... Do whatever you believe in. Moment five. Your favorite place on the campus here at the University of Stuttgart is which one? The cafeteria. I love it. Moment six. Please complete the following sentence. If I could start all over again, I would do the following differently. I would start studying physics or chemistry and then continue with mechanical engineering and obtain a PhD in me mechanical engineering and yeah, I, I guess it's mechanical engineering or maybe it's a PhD in physics. I, I, I'm not sure. So really being more bold with respect to sciences, but I, I, I wasn't when I was 19. And moment seven. Thanks to my studies, you say, I know about myself that... I love structure and I need structure. Once again, thank you for your passionate argumentation, uh, for your ideas and arguments, um, bold, uh, that you give to the pupils that you met today. But beyond that, also to the ministry here uh, of economics here in Baden-Württemberg and beyond that on a national level to many institutions um, and as well and of course to your sparing partners internationally um, likewise. Wishing you all the very best for your, pro for your projects, for your future work, your many responsibilities uh, and uh, as I think the way we got to know you today, um, I have no doubt uh, that uh, there is a lot of shaking coming up uh, along your alley. To our audience, please stay tuned for our upcoming conversations that are always based on what is made in science. My name is Wolfgang Holtkamp. Have a great podcasting day. Goodbye and good talking. <laughs>